further ado, I am thrilled. And as you just heard, uh, the other announcement I wanted to make is that we are recording today's webinar. Uh, this webinar will be available via the NCST website um, later today uh, for further viewing. Uh, so without further ado, uh, welcome again to today's webinar uh, focused on more research needed, a look at the research pipeline uh, for bacterial sexually transmitted infections. I am joined today uh, in presenting uh, uh, by uh, Dr. Jeffrey Klausner, who's a professor of medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases at UCLA. Dr. Klausner will be speaking on key advancements in the treatment and prevention of gonorrhea chlamydia, and syphilis. Uh, Dr. Barbara Vanderpoel is an associate professor of medicine at the Division of Infectious Diseases, University of Alabama at Birmingham. Uh, Bobby will do an overview of the diagnostics pipeline for STIs. And our final presenter will be Jeremiah Johnson, who is the HIV project director at the Treatment Action Group, who will be speaking on community advocacy priorities for bacterial STI research. Before we move into today's presenters, I just want to say um, on behalf of NCSD that we are uh, thrilled to have taken a step in into the supporting the clinical research arena by uh, by commissioning a study with the treatment action group that Jeremiah took the lead on last year, um, and we are uh, uh, already thinking about how to. Uh, support a similar effort going into 2020. I think as everybody on the line uh, who's participating in today's webinar knows, uh, we need to be doing a better light, of, uh, a better job of shedding light nationally on research priorities related to STIs. There is an enormous intersection and a reason for the HIV specifically community to care about these issues. Uh, but we also know that with the rising rates of STIs in America today, research priorities have become an ever bigger priority that we need to be concerned about. We need new treatments, we need new diagnostics, and we need to mobilize communities to support a robust research agenda uh, in this country. And at the end of the day, we also need new resources to be allocated for STI research priorities at the NIH. So without further ado, uh, uh, welcome presenters, uh, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Klausner. Jeff, take it away for us. Hello, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning. This is Jeff Klausner uh, calling in from sunny uh, Los Angeles. In the next 20 minutes, I'm going to uh, cover the uh, current state of the STI uh, pipeline, drugs, and vaccines. Next slide. So, uh, share some disclosures. Um, having uh, left CDC in 2012, uh, now as a uh, independent academic researcher, um, I do a lot of collaborative work with a variety of different uh, diagnostic and uh, therapeutic companies, and also uh, receive a variety of grants from the um, NIH National Science Foundation nonprofits and uh, for-profit entities. Next slide. So as, as uh, you all heard uh, a couple weeks ago, uh, CDC uh, declared gonorrhea an urgent threat. This was a uh, restatement of its original position about um, uh, five years earlier, and drug-resistant Neisseria gonorrhea it exists at threat level urgent, which is the highest uh, threat level, with over a million uh, estimated Neisseria gonorrhea infections occurring annually in the United States. It's estimated that more than half are drug-resistant, and um, those drug-resistant infections and the um, uh, susceptible infections uh, it's estimated that there's over 100 million lifetime direct medical costs. Next slide. Now, uh, the fact that uh, drug-resistant gonorrhea is an urgent threat actually isn't particularly new. So 40 years ago in the New York Times and in um, the um, in, in the post, uh, headline said that WHO acts to curb new strain of VD, incurable new VD could strike safe feds, 
and a new gonorrhea of fear. So uh, unfortunately, we've been facing th th this threat on a regular, uh, continued basis. So uh, why is it worse now, and what's new about it? Next slide. So since the first introduction of antibiotic treatment for gonorrhea in the 1930s with sulfa uh, medications, uh, this slide shows that with each introduction of a new class of medications, within anywhere from 5 to 30 years, the organism becomes resistant to that class. So essentially, we've burned through sulfas, penicillins, tetracycline, spectinomycin, which is not even available in the United States, um, now most recently ceftraxone, and historically ciprocifixime and azithromycin. And the challenge now is that um, there actually are no new existing classes of antibiotics that's available to us, so we must do what we can to preserve uh, ceftraxone therapy. So in the United States, isolates uh, that exist, 99% or more are still susceptible to ceftraxone, but we m must work hard to uh, preserve that. Uh, traditionally, the way we address um, gonorrhea, as I mentioned, is through the development of new antibiotic classes of medications. Next slide. So uh, th this slide shows you uh, the current anti antibiotics that are in development. So solithromycin, which was um, in the um, macrolide class but had a newer type of uh, mechanism of action, Actually, the development of that drug, uh, while promising at first, has uh, currently been halted or uh, suspended by the manufacturer. We don't know if that's going to get back on track. However, there is uh, good news that two new antibiotics, um, Gepetto de, de, de Dacen, um, which is manufactured by uh, GlaxoSmithKline or GSK, is in uh, phase three uh, um, clinical trials and the phase two and two B studies were, were quite promising, so that's currently um, enrolling throughout the United States. And then a second drug, um, zolifidacin, which is uh, de being developed in partnership with WHO and what's called the GARDP, which is the Global Antibiotic Resistance uh, Development Program, um, out of WHO again. That antibiotic is also in uh, phase three clinical trials. And both the um, jepotidacin and the zolifidacin have novel mechanisms of action that we would not expect um, current, uh, current organisms to be resistant to. Um, those are going to have to be introduced carefully. How they'll actually be used in clinical practice remains to be determined. And we're trying to assure that they're, that they're used with good resistance monitoring tests or assays so we do can uh, make sure that as soon as we see any emergence of resistance, which is uh, predictable that we will see, uh, we can know how to best use those drugs and whether they'll be recommended use as single drugs in combination therapy with other drugs as last resort drugs, uh, we don't really know yet. Um, in Europe, they also are evaluating uh, ertapenem, which is an intravenous antibiotic, and some of you may know that there have been ceftraxone-resistant infections of Neisseria gonorrhea in, in Asia, in China in particular, and in the United Kingdom, in France, and Spain, and some of those have actually had to be treated with ertapenem, 1,000 milligrams, intravenous, daily for three days. So that's not a place we want to be. We don't want to be treating a million gonorrhea patients with IV ertapenem for uh, three days, but uh, they are looking to actually um, study that so they know what the actual efficacy is. And then um, there is some interesting uh, um, evaluation of phosphomycin, w w which is an antibiotic that usually we use in multidrug resistant infections, urinary tract infections, it's an oral uh, suspension and um, researchers also in uh, Europe are looking at that. So um, th there is some um, development of new drugs, but as we know, the return on investment, you know, to motivate pharmaceutical manufacturers to develop a drug which is going to be inexpensive, single use, maybe, you know, a million uses uh, a year, there's not a lot of economic incentive in a capitalist system uh, for uh, drug development. Next slide. So be because of that, um, 
some of us have been thinking, well, you know, can we use old drugs for, um, for new uses? So um, some of that work has been led by uh, my team, but now there's others um, as well that have been investigating this. And I'm going to give you a lot more information on the use of ciprofloxacin for an gonorrhea treatment. So ciprofloxacin had been recommended by the uh, CDC from uh, 1989 to 2006. So it had a good run um, from the CDC and it's a recommended use for the treatment of Neisseria gonorrhea. It's highly efficacious in throat infections, rectal infections, cervical infections, urethral infections, but what obviously limited its uh, utility was the, was the frequent development of, of resistance and the frequency of resistance in the population. Um, also, uh, investigators are studying doxycycline for rectal for rectal chlamydia treatment, and it's likely that doxycycline will become the preferred treatment choice for rectal for rectal chlamydia. And then I'll share a little bit of data with you on doxycycline as prophylaxis as a prevention strategy for bacterial STIs like syphilis and chlamydia, for which there are actually ongoing clinical trials now in Seattle, San Francisco, Vancouver, Sydney, Melbourne, Paris, and even in Kenya. All right, next slide. So our next slide takes us back to Cipro from the gonococcal isolate uh, surveillance project or GISP in 2018. We can see for gonorrhea, uh, that blue piece of the pie on the right says 48.7% you, says of gonorrhea infections are susceptible to anything. So if we knew the susceptibility of the infection at the time of treatment, we could use penicillin, we could use amoxicillin, we could use cefixime, and we have a successful treatment outcome. When we look at this by Cipro, we actually see that nearly 70% of all infections are susceptible to Cipro. So um, Peter Kern and I uh, felt, Peter Kern was the LA County STD director in the uh, 2000s when I was in San Francisco, we felt, I wonder if there's a way that we can actually develop tests and use Cipro for treatment in real time based on a uh, test result. Next slide. So back in 1996, a Japanese scientist, uh, M. Tanaka, uh, had reported that there's a specific gene alteration um, in the DNA of the enzyme where ciprofloxacin works. So ciprofloxacin works by binding the gyrase enzyme. That's an enzyme that's key for DNA synthesis in the bacteria. When that enzyme is mutated, the ciprofloxacin doesn't work, and he was able to describe a single point mutation in that um, enzyme DNA that was associated with resistance. And then my student, uh, Alan Blitz, and I looked at this in over 5,000 isolates in over a 20-year period from 16 countries, and we found that that single point mutation was both necessary and sufficient to determine resistance in nearly 99% of infections. So that is an excellent marker that's reliable to predict uh, ciprofloxacin uh, 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 resistance in Neisseria gonorrhea. Next slide. So then the idea was, okay, well, could we use that marker and develop a test to introduce into clinical practice that when then physicians had the test result, they could feel comfortable treating patients with ciprofloxacin in, instead of the standard treatment of ceftriaxone. So NIH funded this study, which we implemented throughout UCLA Health between 2015 and 2017, and I'll share with you some of those uh, outcomes. Next slide. So the first outcome was we were able to see a significant reduction in the frequency of patients who were treated with ceftriaxone from 94%, which is typically the national average, to about 76%. And that actually um, was a substantial reduction given that about half of patients are treated empirically when they come in the door because they have symptoms or their contacts, that many patients are treated on the basis of the first test result, which in sometimes can come back in one or two days, but usually does take three or four days to come back. And we have to have a genotype result that told us it was wild type or a uh, susceptible infection. So we actually did see a fairly substantial reduction in septraxone use with the use of this genotyping method. Next slide. 
so not surprisingly, the, uh, the change was due to the increase in use of ciprofloxacin, and you can see overall that sometimes in half of infections uh, in a given quarter that those patients were treated with ciprofloxacin. Ciprofloxacin, as I mentioned, in susceptible infections is uh, highly efficacious, safe, well-tolerated, and is an um, easy medication to use for uh, partner therapy. Next slide. Now, additionally, the NIH uh, funded a uh, clinical outcome study of which I was the principal investigator. So we wanted to see exactly if we took patients and treated them with ciprofloxacin 500 milligrams single dose, and they had this gyrase A wild type infection based on the genotypic test, would they be successfully treated? We did this in eight clinics across uh, the United States. At the end of the study, we had 117 culture-positive wild-type infections at a variety of anatomic sites, and we performed a culture test to cure at five to seven days. So this was the strictest way, most conservative, that we could look at the efficacy based on culture-based test results. Next slide. And in this study, in what we call the per-protocol uh, analysis group, which, which, which are the patients who were culture positive at baseline, had a culture test done at the time of uh, follow-up, so they didn't miss their follow-up, they weren't lost to follow-up. This is the strictest population. There was a 100% cure at each anatomic site. So whether they were infected in the cervix or, or the urethra or the rectum or the pharynx, all sites demonstrated a 100% cure. So these are uh, very encouraging uh, results for the use of ciprofloxacin in patients where this test is available. Next slide. So uh, um, we call this resistance-guided therapy, that patients are treated on the basis of not only their gonorrhea test, but the resistance test for ciprofloxacin. Cipro has multiple advantages. It's inexpensive, it's oral, easy to use for partners, it's safe for partners, highly efficacious. And then the ultimate idea, which is still yet to be proven, is if we can treat gonorrhea with a variety of different antibiotics, can we reduce the selection pressure? So historically, we've always used one antibiotic to treat gonorrhea. We hit it with that sledgehammer, and eventually the gonorrhea escapes that sledgehammer and becomes resistant. If we use a lot of different, more finer-tuned tools, screwdrivers uh, to keep the analogy going, et cetera, maybe we can reduce the emergence of resistance. Next slide. So now I want to move to uh, doxycycline uh, prophylaxis. So here, doxycycline has been used historically for lots of different infectious diseases, diarrhea, typhus, leptospirosis, and Lyme disease. It's felt to be safe and highly efficacious. Next slide. Early on, uh, when I moved to Los Angeles, uh, Bob Bolin and I, Bob is the uh, medical director of the Los Angeles um, LGBT Center, did a small randomized controlled pilot study of daily doxycycline versus a behavioral intervention to prevent the acquisition of syphilis in HIV-infected men of sex with men. We followed 30 men for uh, nearly a year. And the next slide shows you that uh, there was a 73% reduction in syphilis. Next slide, or next image. And next. And here you can see that there was a 70% reduction in any STD, but importantly, a 73% reduction in syphilis. Now, while this, you know, uh, was not quite statistically um, significant as the Y conf conference interval, it's a pilot study, and the results were quite encouraging. But ultimately, a new study, next slide, was done by the French investigator uh, Jean-Michel Molina, the uh, French scientist who brought us on-demand PrEP, looked at on-demand PEP with doxycycline. So in his randomized control study, he instructed the uh, men to take doxycycline 200 milligrams 24 to 72 hours after sex. And he found that that reduced any bacterial STI by 47%. Next slide. And syphilis by 
So the exact same effect size, 72 or 73 percent, and the reduction of syphilis incidence. So those two randomized controlled trials now have resulted in uh, multi multiple trials being performed um, around the world. Next slide. And then a, a group of investigators from San Francisco looked nationally in the United States to um, ask men if they might be interested in using DOXY for SDI prevention, and 84% um, said that uh, yes, if it was recommended, they would use it. And we also know that a lot of um, men and some clinicians in the United States are using it now um, in um, uh, patients who are at very high risk uh, for syphilis. New slide. And the idea from a public health perspective is if we can get it to the right group, so what we call the core group, those at the highest risk, we can actually have the most profound reduction in uh, the uh, syphilis epidemic. So this is modeling work done from Australia. Next slide. Of course, there are concerns, and those concerns were described in this recent review article uh, by our group and others in clinical infectious d d disease a couple months ago, concerns about resistance, concerns about long-term safety, and Drs. Goldman and Hansfield from Seattle have raised concerns, you know, about the value of preventing STIs versus preventing something that's treatable, what the impact and cost effectiveness might ultimately be. Next slide. So I'm going to wrap up um, with a couple just slides on vaccines because ultimately vaccines would be the way that we'd want to control STIs. Um, as people know, behavioral interventions, promoting condom use, promoting screening and treatment, um, that is an exhaustive process that seems like it can never get adequately funded and we're constantly battling uh, moralists to be able to uh, support adequate inventions. But if we can get vaccines that work, um, that would really be the holy grail. So there is some excitement in this area. The meningococcal B vaccine, uh, which prevents meningitis type B, in three different studies um, was shown to have a 30 to 40 percent protective effect against the acquisition of Neisseria gonorrhea. So those are observational studies, and the NIH has funded University of Alabama and its partners to conduct a multi-year, multi-site, randomized controlled trial among high-risk groups. So we're very excited that that uh, is going to be started in July, and we expect uh, results sometime 2024, 2025. There's also been a successful phase one, which is essentially a safety and early efficacy um, study of a, of a chlamydia trachomonas vaccine that was reported this year, and that vaccine is going to be moving into phase two trials. And then there's some hope on the horizon for a syphilis vaccine. So researchers in Canada and British Columbia reported on the immunogenicity or the ability to produce antibodies against syphilis of a T. pallidum 0751 um, protein or adhesin vaccine, but that's still uh, very early. So next slide. Um, in summary, new antibiotics are forthcoming. We're moving toward implementation of smarter use of older antibiotics like Cipro, and we're hopeful that the CDC 2020 guidelines will include uh, comments or recommendations about the use of these tests uh, to allow ciprofloxacin therapy. And we have some vaccines in the pipeline, but they're still um, a long way off from implementation. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, my name is Barbara Vanderpaul, and I'm a professor of medicine and health behaviors at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And I'm delighted to be following Jeff because I think he gave a great overview of some of the treatment issues. But um, I'm going to go a step back and talk about how do we know who we want to treat and for what. And obviously, that involves diagnostics. Next. Uh, I have a list of disclosures here, most of whom are partners in research, and so they provide funding to UAB. Some consult with me directly. Next. So what's new? Let's talk about things that are here but um, are really fairly new and you might not have actually adopted yet. Go ahead. Um, 
So first, extra general testing. Um, this is now a reality that is supported by FDA cleared tests. We have um, asked for extra general testing since the STD diagnostic guidelines were written in 2009, and this year we've got the first ones approved to the FDA. I mention that because this 10-year process is really important for us to all keep in the back of our minds about how difficult it can be just to, to say this is what our need is and then get the process through to completion. Um, there are two molecular assays that are already cleared for um, throat and anal swabs, and these can be self-collected or clinician collected, and there are more on the way. Um, Jeff led one of the studies that enabled two companies to get clearance, and our group is leading um, another one that's just following right behind. So basically, most of the commercial testing that's being done in the U.S. will now have access to rectal and oral pharyngeal testing without having to do in-lab validation work, which is really meaningful. Next slide. Um, and the reason it's really meaningful is next. Because we see that with chlamydia, there's a mix of where, and this is a study from men who have sex with men, but we see that there's a mix of where these infections occur. But for the most part, if you are screening men who have sex with men for chlamydia, you should be using an anal swab, maybe plus a urine and maybe plus a throat specimen. But you absolutely must be doing anal screening. Next slide. For gonorrhea, it's even more muddled. We see that there's not any one of these three specimen types that is where we will find all of the infections. And so if you want to be sure that you're trying to maximize the potential of the opportunity when you have a patient in front of you, you really have to be testing in all three of these sites. Now, while we're talking about um, research that's needed to help support this type of development, it's very clear from this that the next thing that has to happen is we have to do studies that look at the capacity of pooling all three of those sample types into one laboratory specimen so that health departments can afford the cost of doing this full coverage testing, but without paying three times as much as they're paying right now. Next. Also on the really good news front, we now have mycoplasma genitalium assays cleared. Um, they're, the Hologic Aptima mycoplasma genitalium assay is RNA-based. It was available for quite some long time as a research tool, but it's now been approved this year for multiple sample types. The Roche-Cobos TVMG assay um, is a real-time DNA PCR assay that was also approved this year. So now these are really high throughput automated systems. So when you're doing chlamydia and gonorrhea testing, say from a vaginal swab or a male urine specimen, you can bundle and get trick results as well as mycoplasma results. So this is a mixed bag and sort of a, a double-edged sword because we have to be very cautious when we're bundling our requests to make sure that we're only ordering appropriate tests for a given patient. So for example, if you're doing routine recommended screening of an asymptomatic woman at an annual visit, you should not be testing for mycoplasma. So we want to be very careful that we don't order things that we don't want to treat and manage because we don't know the importance of those asymptomatic infections. Uh, next. There's also a new assay on the immediate horizon, and this is the SpeedX Resistance Plus assay that was developed in um, Australia. This is available with a CE mark in Europe, and it's under evaluation in the US. The nice thing about this assay is it gives you results of MGENT positive or negative, and if the MGENT is positive, then it also gives you at the same time without retesting whether or not macrolide resistance markers are present. And this goes back to Jeff's statement about if we can understand for gonorrhea or in this case for mycoplasma, whether or not the organisms have the resistance genotype, then we could treat accordingly. And in fact, this particular assay um, has been cleared in Europe for use on the Cepheid 90-minute platform. 
So I, you probably are all familiar with the Cepheid CTGC assay that's close to a point of care assay and only takes 90 minutes. People don't always want to wait for that, but when we start talking about mycoplasma, especially in sort of recalcitrant cases of urethritis, I think men might be very willing to wait to find out what their resistance profile looks like so that they can be treated accordingly. Next. So why do we care about resistance in mycoplasma? I'm stepping on Jeff's territory just a little bit here, but what you can see from this slide is the last time we looked, the resistance rates ranged from 44% up to 94% in different places throughout the U.S. and in different populations. So looking at men who have sex with men versus heterosexual men, um, clinic attendees, and men with urethritis, so on and so forth. But you can see that the resistance problem is enormous for mycoplasma. Next. And in fact, Australia has been very forward thinking in responding to these data. Um, by actually treating men with doxycycline for seven days, waiting for the mycoplasma genitalium resistance diagnostic report, and then following that initial doxy for seven days with either azithromycin or with um, moxifloxacin for another seven days. So they have found really good results with this. Next, where they actually have seen cure rates among women above 90%, among women, men who have sex with women and men who have sex with men, cure rates all above 90%. And um, in a different study, again, 244 patients, 68% of whom had the macrolide resistance gene, but by using this two-staged approach, you could attain 92 to 95% um, efficacy rates. So the two-stage really is working. Next. And that's what's been adopted in Australia, and we may be thinking about that for the next round of guidelines here in the U.S. Next. But obviously, I'm just going to say before I go on to talk about point-of-care tests, without having that diagnostic tool, like Jeff was talking about for nice gonorrhea, or like this one for mycoplasma, it's really hard to have that targeted diagnostic or targeted treatment approach. So we really need these diagnostic tools to be available here in the U.S. So with that, I'm going to switch topics and talk about improved point-of-care tests because these are available now. Again, the happy face. So a study by Ron and colleagues, it's a mathematical modeling study, showed that if you have a point-of-care test that detect 95% of cases, it doesn't have to be perfect. And if you only treated 60% of those while they were still in clinic, because some people might not wait for their results, you could reduce prevalence in the United States by 15% just with the coverage that we have right now. You could save about $60 million a year in avoided outcomes that cost the healthcare system money like PID and other complications. Next. So that, that future is now here. We can do this now. Um, we've had the Cepheid Gene Expert System for a while, which has made minor but important changes in how we manage um, testing at emergency rooms and other settings where a rapid test is needed but 90 minutes still qualifies as rapid in the context of the length of the overall visit. But with the Binks new system that detects chlamydia and gonorrhea and is a molecular test, results are now available in a third of that time at 30 minutes. And in a study done here at UAB at our Student Health Center, it only added 11 total minutes of time to the patient's visit. And these students were willing to wait that 11 minutes. And in fact, 84% said they, were gonna, they would wait right today, this minute, even with their class schedule tests and everything else, mm -hmm. if they could get results within even 20 minutes. So we're under that time range now. So it's possible now to do test and treat on the same day because patients will wait this long. Next. And then the next thing that's, that's new and sort of um, out there that we need to be aware of and we need to be thinking about with all of our control efforts is direct-to-consumer marketing. And I put a smiley face and a frowny face on this one because I think there are a lot of things to think about here. Charlotte Gatos has been doing I Want the Kit at Johns Hopkins University successfully for over a decade now. So we know that people can order a test kit, collect their own samples, mail them in, get results, and get referred to treatment. 
this is a great strategy to improve access to care. And I put, or is it? And part of the reason is we really have to think about some of the issues associated with this testing. Often, these are lab developed or modified tests, so we have to understand how these tests really perform. They're not the standard tests that we get at reference laboratories. We have to worry about sample stability. If somebody collects a test and leaves it sitting in the back of their car for a week before they remember to drop it in a mailbox, it's likely to be damaged or compromised. And then we have to consider inappropriate lab requests because the patient is now driving their own management, which I'm in favor of as a general statement, but we have to be cautious. Next. And the reason that we have to be cautious is I've just taken some screenshots here, and you can see that the cost of testing is quite expensive, which is why I said I'm not sure this is a great improvement to access to care because you have to have money to do this. If tests are ranging between $300 and $400, that's problematic. Furthermore, um, you see the target organisms listed, and it includes herpes and treponema pallidum. Next. And I got a call recently from the State Department of Health in Tennessee asking what I thought about a test that had been performed in Alabama from a vaginal swab for a woman, and she was told she was positive for T. pallidum or syphilis. But nobody knows how that vaginal swab was collected, whether it was actually collected, you know, touching an ulcer. So the likelihood of that test to be really truly appropriate is very limited. So we have to be a little bit cautious with these tests. Next. So I'm going to wrap up by just talking a minute about what's on the way next. You can go on to the next. So we have um, things that are hopefully coming, and I put smiley faces and frowny faces by the dual syphilis point of care test because we've had the syphilis point of care test here that's just a non-treponemal test, and implementation and adoption has been fraught with difficulty by people using it in populations where it's not necessarily appropriate to use it and for purposes it wasn't intended for. That said, the good news is if we can get a dual non-treponemal and treponemal antibody tests where we get that result at the same time, it would help us in terms of staging who needs to be processed forward for treatment and who does not. The other tests that are available are non-treponemal and HIV positive at the same time. And again, while that wouldn't allow us to know if this was a new or an existing, pre-existing case of syphilis, it would help us determine how urgent uh, management of that patient is because of the HIV test. There are HIV viral load rapid tests that are available, including one that's made by Cepheid, but they're only available outside the U.S. These are qualitative, and they just say whether or not you're over or under a critical cutoff. But if you're over that critical cutoff, then obviously you need more of a workup to see if you have um, resistance breakthrough. But we don't have access to these in the U.S., again, because of that long and expensive road to um, FDA clearance. Next. So there are improved point of care tests coming. I said the future is here, but we're not done growing. Um, we're going to get shorter time to result. We're going to get down to the 10 minute range, I think. We're going to have multiplex, where we can look at chlamydia, gonorrhea, trichomonas, mycoplasma, maybe even BV. Um, but again, we'll have to be cautious about bundling, as I mentioned earlier. We are going to get to where we're either instrument free or we're using disposable instruments, or even reusable instruments, something similar to like a blood glucose reader. We do have to be cognizant that the cost of development is high, and therefore that cost will be passed on in terms of the retail cost. So again, whether or not we're really helping the population that most needs improved screening is unclear. And then finally, once these become instrument free, of course the intention will be to promote over-the-counter use. And so there will be a lot of things to think about as we move into that realm. Next. So the things that we should be asking are just things like, a woman has a positive chlamydia test. What about gonorrhea or trichomonas? The co-infections are common. What about syphilis if she's pregnant? Are we worried about HIV? How are we going to find her partners? How are we going to get her treated? If she goes into a clinic and sees a professional a clinician, are they just going to do a new test? If they do a new test and it doesn't match, 
are they going to act on the original test or only the test that they just ordered themselves? What if reagents are expired or stored improperly or the timing isn't followed well? And we know all of these things can happen because we've learned these lessons with HIV point of care tests. So ultimately the question is how is quality going to be managed? Next. And we have to think about linkage to care. Do we guarantee that these people actually get treatment? How are we going to handle surveillance? If we don't do surveillance and if we don't report numbers to the CDC, we don't get funding. If we don't get funding, we can't afford to buy the kits. So the surveillance is a really key and critical issue here. How are we going to manage co-infections? How are we going to manage partners? All of these things are things we should be thinking about now. Next. And just to wrap it all up, I think the future is now. We've gotten the things that we've been asking for for decades in this field. But tomorrow is going to be even better because the technological advancements just keep coming. But with those changes in technology, we have to think about changes in clinic flow, changes in clinic utilization, so a lot of testing is not even done in clinic, changes in outreach that allow people to get access to testing in a variety of settings that have traditionally been underserved. And I think that it's just critical to remember that thoughtful and planned change is what we really need in order to support public health efforts. Next. And with that, I'll let Jeremiah wrap us up. Great. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I'll assume. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, um, good afternoon or good morning wherever you're located, um, and thanks for joining the webinar. Um, it's an honor to be able to continue to work with NCSB and Dr. Klausner and Dr. Vanderpool um, on talking more about the STI um, biomedical pipeline. Um, and so I'm just going to take the opportunity here um, to talk about the report that, um, that David referred to earlier. Uh, to plug it and to, um, you know, really Dr. Klausner and Dr. Vanderpool got into sort of more of the meat and potatoes of what's in the pipeline. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk just a, a little bit about, um, you know, where you can access it in case you want to do a deeper dive um, and do some more um, behind the scenes reading on um, that report. And also to talk a little bit more about some of the recommendations that we um, advance in the report and some of the rationale for why we as a community uh, think tank wanted to uh, get more involved in this type of work and, and uh, putting this sort of report together. Um, and as you can see there, I'm the HIV Project Director at Treatment Action Group here in New York. Next slide, please. So in case you haven't heard of TAG, we're an independent activist and community-based research and policy think tank based in New York. Um, that's fighting for better treatment, prevention of vaccine and cure for HIV, and its two most common co-infections, tuberculosis and hepatitis C. Um, we don't have STIs in the mission statement yet, but we are trying to get increasingly involved in this space as we begin to see um, how our efforts to try and end HIV as an epidemic in New York, um, uh, across the U.S., as, as in the nation as a whole and, and beyond, uh, are intricately linked to our ability to address bacterial STIs as well um, in priority populations who are also disproportionately impacted by HIV. Next slide, please. So this is the report, and uh, we're very proud. This was our first pipeline report. Our organization is uh, known for putting out a number of pipeline reports related to uh, you know, what is uh, being researched for prevention, cure, treatment, uh, vaccines, diagnostics uh, for the diseases that we uh, look at. Uh, we put this out back in March. So some of the information that you've heard today from um, Dr. Klausner and Dr. Vanderpool uh, may be a little bit more up to date on some things, but <clears throat> it's still a, a very recent resource that we hope is useful for um, any stakeholders to be a bit more focused on the pipeline um, and the types of innovations that we need to really rein in um, bacterial STI infections um, in uh, the U.S. and around the globe, and particularly in priority populations. And we really wanted to um, get more involved in this kind of report and putting this together to try and call more attention to community advocates, advocates working on sexual health 
and other areas to focus uh, more on our, our needed role in bacterial STIs and to also pivot away from perhaps um, other types of advocacy that we've been involved in to learn the lessons that we've learned from HIV prevention where innovation has been key in reining in new infections and to get us a bit more focused on research activism and um, activism related to scaling up of uh, existing and new tools in the future um, in the communities that most need them. Next slide, please. So um, I'm just going to go briefly into some of the recommendations from the report and invite you to uh, read the report and, and do a deeper dive yourself. Um, but one of the recommendations that we make uh, in the report and one of the rationales for us to even talk about all of this is we wanted to make a case for HIV STI activism. There are many different reasons for this um, and uh, there are things that community advocates are able to accomplish that other stakeholders just aren't um, as well positioned to do. Um, and uh, for activists, um, there are a number of reasons for us to get involved. Um, one is simply the sheer burden of uh, new infections that we continue to see with STIs um, and the collective burden that it has on our communities. I think for those of us working in HIV prevention advocacy, that the way in which we contextualize these bacterial infections as individuals often living um, and being sexual within, uh, you know, networks that are dealing with these epidemics. So um, there are different narratives competing with all of this and in terms of um, how important they are on sort of a case-by-case -case basis. But as a collective issue that we're dealing with as communities, it's hard to deny um, that this is uh, hugely impactful, and particularly amongst communities that are already stigmatized in terms of our sexual practices. This just makes it that much more difficult for us to have a sexually empowered, community-empowered approach to addressing all of the diseases that are related to um, sexual transmission. So um, the WHO back in 2016, came up with an estimate that we are seeing around a million new infections per day from four STIs, gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, and trichomoniasis. We've obviously been hearing a lot in the media recently about new surveillance in the U.S. Um, of record-breaking uh, reported infections in the U.S. Um, we uh, saw 2.4 million reported syphilis, gonorrhea, and chlamydia infections in 2018, and that's an increase of 100,000 from the previous year. Um, and uh, while reported uh, infections is not the same as incidents, then you know, we can be hopeful that perhaps maybe in some pockets, in some cases, maybe we're catching more infections um, through increased testing. Um, the fact is, is that this is an enormous number of infections, and there is uh, a lot of coordinated effort that needs to be done to really focus on sexual health and well-being in our communities overall. Um, this is a slightly older, uh, uh, you know, uh, estimate that came from the CDC back in 2008 that also looked at the financial impact that we see within our communities. Um, and uh, at that time, there was an estimate of $517 million dollars in um, costs related to chlamydia annually, 163 million in terms of gonorrhea, 40 million in terms of syphilis. And we can imagine that with um, increased infections and with inflation, we're probably seeing a lot more than that now. Um, the images on the slide here are uh, from a recent fact sheet from the CDC showing also that uh, the community, some of the communities that are disproportionately affected by HIV are also um, being disproportionately affected by these uh, epidemics. We've seen over the past five years an increase from around 187,000 new gonorrhea infections amongst gay and bisexual men, an increase to about 341,000 new cases um, in uh, 2018. And amongst women, um, and uh, women of color are disproportionately impacted by sexually transmitted infections in the U.S. 1.8 million cases of chlamydia um, in, in 2018. Um, and we are seeing an estimated 20,000 cases of infer infertility amongst women each year. So these are significant burdens 
and something that we need to have a collective um, and multi-stakeholder and community inclusive response on how we're going to address this going forward. Next slide, please. And of course, um, while I think for a number of advocates, again, that there is a different sort of individual relationship with bacterial STIs, I know that um, if I go to the clinic and I receive a diagnosis for gonorrhea, chlamydia, or even syphilis, um, that, that is a different type of news to receive compared to an HIV infection. And I think that many of us, when living in communities, are operating uh, in a way that, that um, allows us to be empowered, be who we are sexually, um, but, uh, you know, uh, continue to, uh, you know, take care of ourselves and take that more as perhaps a testing and treatment sort of conversation rather than the same sort of um, impactful news that an HIV infection was. But the fact is, is that more severe consequences are possible and certain communities are more impacted than other communities. Certainly individuals who um, are pregnant or may become pregnant um, there is a different sort of risk that we are seeing in those situations. And syphilis remains the second leading cause of stillbirth and miscarriage worldwide. Undetected gonorrhea and chlamydia carry an increased risk of blindness for babies. Um, again, issues of infertility are um, concerning for um, individuals who, who may become pregnant. And while uh, in terms of prevalence, we're not seeing high rates of neurosyphilis, um, when those cases do occur, um, and, and there is probably some need to, to track a bit better exactly uh, what's going on with that. Uh, it is a significant consequence and certainly reason for us to try and decrease the over level, overall levels of syphilis within um, uh, highly impacted communities, including men who have sex with men. Next slide, please. Um, so, in terms of just the impact and the consequences, we really make a case here uh, that we need to get more um, sexual health advocates focused on bacterial STIs and, and HIV prevention advocates more involved in this conversation. There's also the uh, you know, argument that uh, bacterial STIs continue to exacerbate our ability to address HIV epidemics in general. While we know that PrEP and U equals U uh, messaging, you know, that these are interventions that work very well and even within the context of STI epidemics, the fact of the matter is, is that while we are trying to scale up those interventions and while we are trying to address this across all populations, that bacterial injections in the meantime have long been shown to be associated with increased risk of acquiring and transmitting HIV. Um, and in fact, a recent modeling study found that 10.4% of new HIV infections amongst men who have sex with men could be attributed to chlamydia and gonorrhea infections. Um, and so there is a broader reason for us to be uh, more, uh, you know, involved as HIV advocates in this. Next slide, please. I believe also that there is a, a bit more of an indirect reason why we need to be uh, more concerned about a holistic approach to sexual health and well-being amongst communities where we're also addressing HIV prevention. Um, so, uh, you know, we know that healthcare providers are struggling to provide PrEP and U equals U messaging to all of uh, their patients. And we also know that frequently um, one factor that is a problem with getting that messaging out there are fears of risk compensation. Now, I would argue it's incredibly irresponsible to try and uh, hold the consequences of uh, or the potential consequences of one disease over the heads of populations as a sort of Damocles in order to continue to keep them using condoms to avoid other sorts of um, health conditions. But the fact of the matter is, is that it's difficult to uh, sort of change this narrative on risk compensation to uh, come at it from a more sex positive, more community empowered approach, so long as we're dealing with more news about um, skyrocketing STI infections. And uh, we actually saw this brought up even just in an article last week at Forbes talking about uh, the difficulties of uh, scaling up PrEP due to uh, fears of risk compensation amongst vulnerable communities. 
And this image here comes from an innovative and interesting study out of Yale a few years ago um, that shows the so-called prevention paradox where surveyed um, providers were more likely to provide PrEP to individuals who said that they uh, were using condoms and less likely to provide PrEP to individuals who said that they were struggling with or did not want to use condoms, which of course is the inverse of what we want to see. And so to really switch the narrative, I think we need a more holistic approach, more of an understanding about how to uh, rein in bacterial STIs overall. Next slide, please. So in many ways, the report, and I don't know how many of you on the webinar consider yourself to be um, community advocates. If you aren't, I invite you to become a community advocate. Um, if not, I invite you to work more with us and call us into your work, um, because we really need to expand the lessons of HIV prevention um, that we've seen and to bring that, uh, that level of activism, that level of commitment, that level of lived experience and innovation into the conversation about bacterial STIs overall. Um, so U equals U and PrEP advocates, similar to reproductive health uh, advocates, have brought the conversation of choice, community empowerment, and dare I say it, pleasure into the mix. Um, and that's something that we need more of in this conversation and to have a bit more of a conversation about what we want to see uh, for a community empowered sort of sexual revolution. And for that to happen, we need to have better tools and we need to get more committed to talking about community advocacy for biomedical research, for increased investment in that research, and more focus on addressing the structural and policy factors that are keeping individuals from accessing um, all of the tools that are available to them. Um, and this is essential as we've learned from HIV prevention where we have recently seen dramatic decreases in new HIV infections um, thanks to the advent of PrEP, thanks to the advent of U equals U, that would have never been possible if we just continued to try and package behavior change and condom usage. Um, and that's a lesson and a message that we need to get out there more broadly within the field of bacterial STIs. Next slide, please. Um, so as I said, if you don't consider yourselves to uh, be sexual health advocates, you know, community-based uh, uh, advocates, um, I encourage you to invite us to the table. I know uh, NCSD is currently doing more work around this to try and convene more of us to have a, a national conversation about this. Engage us meaningfully, provide transparent data and communication to bring us into this conversation. Uh, webinars like this, I think, go a really long way in terms of helping people to be more aware of what's in the pipeline and how we might be able to shift the narrative and how we might be a bit more hopeful about what is in the pipeline because I don't think that we often know enough about that. And then finally, fund us if you have the capability to do so. Uh, we don't always have the resources to get as involved with this work as we would like, but it's incredibly important to have community at the table to move this forward. Next slide, please. So that's the long pitch for, for advocates on the line to hopefully get more involved in this and to really integrate this into all of the great initiatives that we're seeing about trying to end HIV as an epidemic around the country. Um, in some of the other recommendations in the report, we talk a bit about where we might want to put some of our advocacy efforts and to pivot away from solely looking at advocacy around individual behaviors or community campaigns um, that are perhaps maybe more fear or shame based um, into things that are looking at um, innovation and looking at addressing structural factors. So one major target, of course, is that we need to have more advocacy for increased research dollars. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Klausner addressed the, um, the uh, new uh, investment in STI vaccine research. Um, an initial $90 million from NIH is going to move us in the right direction, but we're going to need a lot more resources um, around that research going forward in general, and we need to have a more robust sort of community advocacy response to move that forward. Um, we also need to have a broader conversation about how we can guarantee access of new tools while discussing appropriate incentives for innovation. Dr. Clauser mentioned the challenges of bringing industry partners um, into the fold around all of this. 
And we need to have uh, a broader conversation about how we make the case and how we show that there really will be demand for these products moving forward um, and that there is a market, uh, as, as much as I hate to talk about health things from a market perspective, that there is uh, going to be some sort of demand in order to bring people to the table. And right now, Treatment Action Group is actually hoping uh, to draft a report talking about what are some of those priority research targets? What is sort of the minimum uh, funding needed right now in order to move those forward um, and to help generate more advocacy around that? But that's pending funding and hopefully uh, we can find funding for that report and move it forward in the near future. Next slide, please. Um, we also need to have a multi-stakeholder discussion about early implementation on these pipeline tools. We've talked about a number of hopeful developments today, um, and we need to be talking right now about what implementation looks like and how we move things through faster um, in order to avoid any unnecessary delays. Um, so, uh, you know, as uh, Dr. Vanderpool was talking about with some of the diagnostics. We need to talk about costs up front, and we need to talk about a cost that guarantees access but incentivizes innovation. Um, and we need to have discussions around this for things such as uh, Dolly Flotison, uh, Jepiditison, uh, or however you say either of those words, uh, for multi-drug resistant and extreme drug resistant gonorrhea. We need to have those conversations now in order to make sure that we're not running up against any sort of uh, burdensome barriers moving forward uh, around uh, drug resistant gonorrhea. Um, we need to talk about uh, how stakeholders and community stakeholders can help with rapid advancement through regulatory processes where needed for um, access to new diagnostics and some of the hopeful developments that we're seeing in the pipeline. And we also need to uh, have community involved in order to potentially combat sex negative or paternalistic narratives around tools such as scaling up doxycycline as PrEP or PEP for chlamydia and syphilis. Um, because I think, uh, at least in conversations I've had with certain public health officials and some providers, there's a certain amount of um, anxiety about using an antibiotic in that sort of way. And yet, as Dr. Klausner pointed out, there are a number of other conditions where doxycycline has been used in this way. And uh, we need to have a more nuanced, uh, engaged discussion around this. This image here um, on this slide is actually from a study out of Australia looking at an increase in STI infections amongst PrEP users. Um, and I, I think in general, we keep talking about doxycycline as this sort of major, broad uh, public health uh, response tool, you know, pot uh, potentially amongst um, gay and bisexual men. But what this sort of more nuanced look at the number of new infections shows is that uh, while we did see an increase overall, um, it's, uh, it's actually a small subset of participants in that population that are getting STIs more than once a year and actually contributing disproportionately to the increase overall, um, so-called overachievers uh, uh, within these communities. And if those are the types of dynamics we're looking at, perhaps there's a more nuanced way of talking about scaling up of pre-exposure or post-exposure prophylaxis doxycycline um, that's a bit more targeted targeted to these populations um, and helps to drive down um, overall new infections in uh, a way that's reflective of the complexity of the epidemic. Next slide, please. Finally, um, in the report, uh, while uh, we're talking about pipeline in the report, we do also have a, a brief recommendation talking about that we need community advocacy to be more involved in terms of implementation of existing tools as well. Um, you know, even in situations like with Bicillin LA, you know, where we have a very effective treatment for syphilis, we've continued to see problems with shortages um, since, you know, the, the year 2000. Um, and TAG was actually involved a few years ago with a sign-on letter sent to Pfizer, the only approved manufacturer for Bicillin LA in the United States, to try and uh, get more of a multi-stakeholder response to put more pressure on Pfizer to address those shortages. Um, and uh, that's the sort of thing that we need more engaged community to ensure that we're addressing many of the ongoing problems that are still happening because those shortages occurred. Um, and we need to be more engaged around that. 
funding, obviously, for uh, infrastructure, uh, for public health clinics, for addressing STIs um, and prevention in general, we've seen ongoing declines um, as presented in this report that um, NCSD was involved in putting together, um, showing a, a, a de facto decline in uh, the um, funding that's going to STI prevention nationally. And we really need more community advocacy to try and address that as well. Um, and I put in a picture here from in New York uh, where TAG was uh, involved in some light civil disobedience, um, some, uh, uh, some street activism around closures of STI clinics and a stripping of resources from city clinics here in New York that actually led to an increase in millions of dollars for the city health clinics. Um, thanks to that community advocacy, and has helped really put us more on track with our efforts to try and end HIV as an epidemic and address bacterial STIs overall. And so really a need for more robust community advocacy around that as well. Next slide, please. So um, this is my last slide. Um, uh, hopefully this uh, wasn't too disjointed of a, a presentation if you felt like uh, it was, uh, you know, that there's more of this that you want to read about or more that you want to dive into. We definitely invite you to come and look at the um, STI pipeline report that TAG put together, um, something that we're hoping to use as a basis for ongoing updates um, for all stakeholders going forward. Um, and one final shameless plug, I uh, ask you that if you are uh, a funder or, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, in, uh, can contact with individuals who are able to fund. Um, please fund sexual, uh, sex positive sexual health advocates to be more involved with this work. We bring a certain expertise and um, lived experience and skill set that is essential for trying to address this moving forward. So with that, I'll turn it over. Thank you. Jeremiah, thank you very much. And uh, Jeff and Bobby, thank you both very much as well. Um, uh, this is David Harvey again uh, from NCSD. Uh, but I am just thrilled with the uh, succinctness of this wonderful overview of the science, as well as the community um, and community activist perspective about where we are at on STI research uh, in the United States. And with that, um, we're going to move right away into some questions. We've had quite an active uh, posting of questions on the chat function. Um, for those of you who can stay with us, we will extend the time of this uh, webinar slightly until about 3:20, 3:25 Eastern Standard Time, but we will not go much. We will not go beyond that time. Uh, we're going to do our best to kind of group some of these questions based on our quick analysis of the questions that have been posted. And so, bear with me as I try to uh, move through this. Um, we will also try to group the questions for each presenter. So the first question I'm going to go to is uh, one posed by Charlotte Gatos. Um, how, and, and this will be for you, uh, Jeff, how do we measure risk versus benefit of doxyprophylaxis in the core group with confidence? Yeah, that's an excellent question about the uh, risk, risk versus benefit. Um, I mean, it's always a challenge how to measure any of our, um, you know, public health interventions for disease control. So um, the multiple randomized controlled trials will be able to um, you know, measure the, um, you know, effect within the population and the reduction of acquisition of syphilis. Um, I mean, the, the epidemiology of syphilis in the United States is, you know, quite complex. It looks like we have uh, two epidemics, uh, one in, um, you know, disenfranchised heterosexuals that's uh, driven by uh, substance use and, um uh, you know, a severe decline in access to uh, services and uh, screening in certain counties uh, in the United States. And you have a second epidemic in um, men who have sex with men, both HIV infected and uh, HIV at risk, who may be using uh, PrEP as uh, prophylaxis. And the, you know, doxycycline studies currently are in just that second group, and how you can show impact in that uh, first group. Uh, remains to be um, determined. So I think that's you know, would remain an open question. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I'm going to move forward with two, grouping two more questions for you, Jeff, before we move on to Bobby. Uh, but from Vivian and Jessica, uh, can, first, can you say a bit more about the logistics use of the gyrase test 
if I'm saying that correctly, in, in the UCLA study, what is the turnaround time of the test and what venues was it used? Second question for you then, Jeff, is there a concern of the increase of floxy reactions? Yeah, so um, in terms of the two implementation studies, the one done at UCLA and then the NIH one done in the eight clinics, uh, the test turnaround time ranged from about two to four days. On average, um, the gonorrhea result uh, took um, about four or five days to come back. But, you know, that was a really proof of concept um, studies to see if providers would change their practice and then what, th what was the uh, clinical efficacy of using that test result. So right now there's um, um, at least one commercial manufacturer um, in California called Shield Bio uh, um, who makes the test available with a one-day uh, to two-day turnaround, but you have to send the specimens to them for your chlamydia and gonorrhea testing, and they run it off the Aptima um, Hologic uh, system. And then um, there are... Um, uh, as Bobby mentioned, outside the United States, there's EU approval for the SpeedX assay. Uh, we're trying currently to get uh, resources and funding to do the required evaluations that would allow that SpeedX assay to get um, FDA approved. And that SpeedX assay is a couple hour uh, turnaround time uh, for a test that would be run off a positive uh, specimen. And um, you know, the unfortunate news is that um, the current NIH clinical trials group, CTG, is winding down, and it's going to take um, a couple years um, until the new mechanisms get um, activated to allow um, NIH to support some additional clinical trials. So we need a creativity, innovation, and um, everything Jeremiah says about advocacy. And more money. Um, <laughs> this is David Harvey again. I'm going to move right on to you, Bobby. Two questions grouped together from Charlotte, Charlotte and uh, Christine. The first is, how do we engage the FDA in regulating home collection for commercial online tests that may be inappropriate, costly, and not using FDA cleared assays? And then secondly, very specifically, how did you manage the woman with a positive syphilis home test? Well, so the first one is the harder one, so I'm going to do the second one first. Um, the person with the positive syphilis home test had to be referred in to a clinician, and we tried to encourage her to go to an STD-trained clinician because syphilis can be quite difficult, you know, in terms of diagnostics, et cetera. So um, that's all we could do is urge her to go into a healthcare professional that has some knowledge about syphilis and give her a better workup. Because you can't, obviously, you know, if she was going to receive treatment, it was going to be an injection, so it's not like you could have sent her drugs anyway. She was going to have to go see somebody, even if we believe the test. So so that, that one's the easy one. The harder one is engaging the FDA about home collection of tests and also over-the-counter tests, but also just some of these tests that are available ex-US and are working fairly well, but that because of the way... Um, we approve tests here in the U.S., the whole process is, is really kind of burdensome. And so I think that when Jeremiah was talking about advocacy, this is a place, too, where I think if we could get people to engage in advocacy about diagnostics, because if you, if you think about how we got HIV point-of-care diagnostics approved in this U.S., it was hugely through activism, right? So they said, you know, we cannot wait until a test is perfect and we need this now and, and we want you to continue to improve them, but we need things to be available. But then how do we do things like get people who are doing um, not necessarily kosher testing because they're not really rejecting some of the specimens they should reject. Unfortunately, that has to come from CMMS and Medicare Medicaid because they have to say, you know, this is an appropriate use of these tests and this is not what your CLIA license allows you to do. And hopefully we could work maybe with um, College of American Pathology and get people to be a little bit tighter in looking through validation work before they accredit this type of test. 
But really, even the validation work aside, this is a, a situation, if you think about the woman's vaginal swab, where the, the sample should have just been rejected or that specific analyte should not have been tested and, and a letter should have gone back to the patient explaining why that was the case. But So some of these things are FDA issues and some of them are not FDA issues, but in general, we need advocacy to help us continue that conversation about why we urgently need improved diagnostics in this country. And then finally, to Jeremiah's point, the sad news about that advocacy about Bicillin is that Pfizer stopped making it. So now we only have one place in the entire world that makes Bicillin. They make it one time a year, and if every country in the world doesn't place their order accurately, there are shortages. And so do we need advocacy around people like at DARP who can think creatively about how to, to make antibiotics in a cheaper way than what pharma has been able to do? Maybe that's the way we need to go and we need advocacy to be pushing that funding for research that can help us stop doing the same thing that's not working. Hey, Bobby, can you just uh, review for folks who is the one producer of Bicelin now? I don't know the name of the company, and they're in China. And yeah, so yeah, Bobby. The information uh, it it changes often. So it's manufactured in China, but then it goes to uh, Switzerland, where they create the uh, finished product, and then Pfizer does distribution in the United States. So uh, Jeremiah and IDSA and others have been on calls with Pfizer. It's a very complicated process. They actually were talking about raising the price to $500 a dose. Um, IDSA and HIVMA have been excellent in communication with Pfizer. It's, it's uh, thank you for that information. That should be obviously profound concern to all of us, particularly with the trade wars going on with China. Uh, and of course, I don't need to say anything more about that. that. No, overnight. And, exactly. And exactly. Um, so moving right on, because we have limited time, I want to make sure that we get some more questions. Uh, these next two, uh, uh, next three questions, again, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, two questions are for Bobby, correct team? Um, Jose, when did you think, when, uh, Bobby, when do you think the MGen will be a notifiable infection? And there is a question about a general comment from any panelist about, um, Opinions about the current status of the EPT in the United States. So we'll take the first one from Jose first, uh, Bobby. So I don't think MGen will be notifiable in the same way that TRIC is not notifiable. I don't think it's going to meet the criteria that the CDC looks for for notifiable diseases. So I don't, I don't think, I don't get the sense that the guidelines are going that way. And part of the problem too is that we just really don't know what to do about asymptomatic MGen. We don't know if there are negative health consequences to that or if it's self-clearing. So until we have better epidemiology, we can't make better recommendations, but we can't have better epidemiology until we have better diagnostic tests so we can understand the scope of the problem. So it's all part and parcel, but I don't, I don't think that's happening anytime soon. I'll let somebody else okay, answer, answer EPT. Yeah, uh, Jeff, maybe you have a view on EPT, but I also, uh, Jeremiah, want to ask for a community activist perspective on EPT as well. Jeff, anything you want to add? Uh, Jeff here. So, uh, there, actually, I didn't give the uh, comment on the Floxy. So, um, you know, FDA has definitely uh, increased its warnings of the use of um, ciprofloxacin and other fluoroquinolones, but that's generally associated with multi-doses, long-term use, um, not single-dose therapy. So um, we discussed this actually at the CDC treatment guidelines meeting in June and, um, you know, did not feel those uh, FDA warnings were uh, relevant to a single one-time dose. In terms of uh, expedited partner therapy, um, you know, I think in um, certain states they do support the use in men of sex with men. Again, I feel personally it's been paternalistic to deny uh, proven effective uh, treatment to uh, certain populations based on, you know, fears that that 
population might not seek additional testing, might have um, other undetected infections like HIV, but, you know, there's difference of expert um, opinion on this. I think um, if the uh, use of gyrase testing and ciprofloxacin therapy for gonorrhea can really be scaled up, um, providers uh, might feel better about using ciprofloxacin uh, to treat partners. Thank you for that. Jeremiah, anything you want to add about EPT? Um, I mean, my my general bias, you know, is, you know, whenever we're able to sort of lower the threshold for access to effective treatment for individuals who are marginalized and having a hard time uh, perhaps, being fit, uh, perhaps fitting into their schedules, you know, uh, making it to a provider, getting tested, you know, I, I think uh, when we try to uh, sort of centrally control a response uh, too much, uh, I, that concerns me. And so I would probably be of the mindset, you know, I can't speak more broadly for all of community on that one. I, we haven't had, um, you know, conversations about that more collectively, but I would tend to, to agree with perhaps Dr. Klausner's um, comments. Uh, around that. Great. Thank you very, very much, Jeremiah. So we are at the end of the posted questions. So I want to thank um, once again our panelists and everybody who uh, participated in today's webinars for posting your questions. Once again, I want to urge you to reach out if you have further uh, questions that NCSD can help you with. Um, this webinar and the materials will be posted so that people can disseminate this webinar for uh, future viewings. And um, I just, we may have one more question coming. Uh, but uh, once again, I, I also want to um, thank you, Jeremiah, for uh, pointing out the work that you hope to do in the future uh, with TAG on um, uh, additional reports. Um, I know speaking for NTSD, we are very interested in uh, continuing uh, to build um, an advocate and an activist uh, uh, community response to these issues. Uh, so we look forward to working with you. And uh, Bobby, I'm going to pull you into that discussion as well, uh, knowing that you lead ASTDA. Um, so the last comments posted are thank you for the webinar. We appreciate that. Um, and thank you all, and have a very good rest of the day. Bye-bye.